BC's Pro Wrestling Amplified Podcast, Episode 9. Action! My Amplified Unit, welcome to BC's Pro Wrestling Amplified Podcast. They say time flies when you're having fun. Well, in the words of Kurt Angle, oh, it's true. It's damn true. Because those words have never been more truer than what we created nine weeks ago. It was a simple concept. I wanted you guys to enjoy a much longer video covering a plethora of pro wrestling topics. But I didn't want you to feel compelled to watch me for such a long time. So I wanted you guys to use this as an audio file if need be. But still right here on YouTube. So I did that. I made much longer videos. I covered a plethora of topics so that you guys can listen to me on a long car ride. Or maybe just a a car ride to work. Or maybe in the background while you're doing your homework. Or you listen to me while at the local supermarket. Or in the gym. Or running your errands. But you didn't have to watch the Amplified Man because they are long video files. Audio files, if you will. And you guys could listen. So I ran the experiment nine weeks ago, and here we are nine weeks later, and clearly not only am I enjoying dishing these videos out to you, these audio files, but you guys are clearly digging them. And it is for that reason that we keep rocking this format out. And here we are, episode nine already. I want to thank you guys so much for smashing that subscribe button, smashing that notification bell, smashing the like button on every video. Dropping down the comments, showing and sending the love because I'm showing and sending it right back to every single one of you. That shows the love, man, to this channel in these videos. Honestly, um, without you guys, this shit ain't fun. Not at all. You make all of this go around, man. And just like last week, we're doing it again this week. We're coming out two days earlier with this podcast. So if you're part of my Sunday unit that thought this was coming out on Sunday, welcome. To you folks, I hope you enjoy it, welcome, and keep kicking ass. However, you're two days late. That's why I always say, don't just be subscribed, smash the notification bell, and then keep up to date on that as well, because you two will screw around with that, and they'll take you off the notification bell system. They'll unsubscribe you from the channel without either one of us knowing. So always stay on top of it as well. But you need to be subscribed and notified at all times. You never know when I'm going to pump out the podcast or any other impromptu video, guys. Because for my Sunday, folks, this is a Friday that this is going up live on the channel. So for my Friday, folks, clearly you are my notification squad. And you guys rock above. You guys are on a whole nother level. You're above all the other AMP unit members because you're not just subscribed, you're notified. You're smashing that like button, you're dropping those comments, you're kicking ass every second of every day. I just know it because AMP unit members that are the top level guys, a whole nother level, we all run in the same click. We're the badass folk. So to my Saturday click, my Sunday click, I hope you enjoy it, but you're late. Don't be late to a BC video. Always stay notified. I mean that, guys. Um, Because I don't want you guys to be late. You know, when I pump this out on a Friday, I want my whole unit, you know, being ready to kick that ass for however long this video slash audio file is going to be. I don't want you guys separate. I don't want a Friday unit, a Saturday unit, a Sunday unit. I want an amplified unit. But that's it, guys. I had to pump this out on a Friday because just like um, last week, I I just have a, a huge weekend uh, in store, man, just a lot of things going on and a lot of things need to get done. So this podcast has to be pumped out. Uh, luckily for me, man, it's WrestleMania season. There's a lot of news to cover, even though this is all being done on a Thursday night. So I can pump this out on Friday morning. There's a lot of news. And a lot of this is what I'm about to go over for my Sunday folks. By Sunday, a lot of this stuff could have changed. There could be rebuttals. And what I mean by that is like, My first story, the top story of this podcast, it's Becky Lynch and Ronda Rousey, guys. Things are heating up online. And I don't know if they're just going into... I mean, I can't see that this would be Vince McMahon okaying this or WWE social media okaying this. But this has taken a turn that is way out of kayfabe, but way out of just reality as well. 
You know what I mean? Like sometimes you t you see two wrestlers, whether male or female, they go at each other on social media and you know they're bringing a sense of realism into the kayfabe world or they're bringing that into the world of a work. And we love it. I don't know how much of this is just, they're just really just saying, fuck this. Like this is not how it was supposed to go. Um, we're being... Turned every which way. Everything's changing on us. We don't know really the direction. They're telling us one thing. It's being changed minute to minute. Vince is calling us every 10 minutes with something changed. Or something is no longer going to happen. Maybe this is Becky getting pissed. Maybe this is Rousey getting pissed. It looked to me, Monday Night Raw guys, that Rousey was pissed at Becky Lynch. Like, for real. I told you guys that on the Monday Night Raw review and reaction show. I told you guys... Ronda Rousey was not selling at all. And this isn't just somebody who looked green and wasn't selling. This looked like somebody who purposely was not selling for Becky. Becky was throwing crutch shots and Ronda just wanted to get the crutch and beat the shit out of Becky. That's what it looked like to me. And I told you guys that, man. That did not look staged. I mean, the segment was staged, but it didn't look to me at all. What Anger, did you... What the fuck? Fucking A. Give me some room over here. I don't know if Anger just jumped because he, he can't take any more of this Becky Ronda shit or he just... I don't know, man. Anger just took a nosedive. I'll see if he's okay after the podcast. I need room to work, man. This is a big story, guys. And after Monday Night Raw, it just looked to me like this was not... The segment was staged. It looked like Ronda went into business for herself and wanted to literally kind of take shots at Becky Lynch. So I think there's friction there. This took on a life of its own, and now I really think that what I am saying is accurate. After what they said, I, I believe these, hold on, these tweets, guys, were on the 28th. So this was, uh, yeah, this, this was all done. Literally, guys, I'm filming this podcast on a Thursday, Thursday evening. A third day? Is that a new day? Third day. On Thursday evening, I'm filming this. This was just put out just a couple of hours ago. So this was done on a Thursday. By now, maybe they've retaliated much more with each other. Um, this was the first of it, guys. Let me just make sure it's all... Uh... Okay, so the first of this was on the 26th, which would have been Tuesday. This was the night of SmackDown. And Becky Lynch tweeted out to Ronda Rousey. Rhonda, you go back and get that belt because I didn't come this far to collect it from Stephanie. I came all this way to take it from you. So that seems like the man Becky Lynch is still kind of in character. Nothing over or out of bounds there. Um, but Ronda Rousey did not take too kind to that, guys. The next morning at 10.53 a.m., this is Wednesday morning, Ronda Rousey retaliated with, that's what I'm trying to do, dumbass. You hobbling around trying to be a ginger, ginger crutch ninja and taking fake prison photos in the hallway isn't helping. So I don't know if you guys can see. These are some videos that Becky Lynch had posted on her social media. They were fake mug shots, as Ronda Rousey would say. Obviously, she wasn't actually going to jail. She didn't actually take mug shots. Uh, but right up top here, guys. Those are the mug shots. Hopefully you guys can see them. That's uh, Becky Lynch. Ronda Rousey came right out. You talk about breaking kayfabe. She used the F word. Fake. And again, Ronda Rousey said, that's what I'm trying to do, dumbass. You hobbling around trying to be a ginger crutch ninja and, and taking fake prison photos in the hallway isn't helping. The man Becky Lynch was not happy with that. She responded... And this was the next day now, 1.45 p.m. Earlier today, which is Thursday, by the time you guys are seeing it, it's this weekend. But again, this was Thursday, February 28th, 1.45 p.m. Keep that F word out of your mouth and concentrate on getting better at this business instead of trying to remain above it. Looking forward to seeing you real soon. That's what Becky Lynch retaliated to Ronda Rousey. So Rousey said, quit taking fake prison photos in the hallway. And Becky Lynch said, keep the F word out of your mouth. So Becky Lynch is like me. Don't use the F word in pro wrestling. Whether it's the actual in-ring competition or the storyline. Don't use the F word. 
Ronda Rousey retaliated. This was uh, 2.21 p.m. So this was 15, 36 minutes after that last Becky Lynch tweet. Ronda Rousey tweets back, F word, question mark? You mean fake, in parentheses? Fake like your nonsensical BS armbar that doesn't even work and just looks like you're holding the dick you wish you had? Can't make this up, guys. Sorry for you younger viewers. But that's what Rousey tweeted to Becky Lynch. You mean fake? Fake like your nonsensical BS armbar that doesn't even work and just looks like you're holding the dick you wish you had. Guys, that's not something Vince McMahon or Suits and Ties would ever let go up on social media, would ever approve. And I wouldn't be surprised if by the time you guys are watching this that that tweet is taken down because that's heavy. I don't know if you guys can see it. That's Becky Lynch. And there's a... Uh... Oh, I'm going to show you actually. Hopefully you guys are seeing this, man. It might be... It's, it's double-sided, so maybe you're not. But that's... She tweeted out the photo of Becky Lynch having a kind of half-ass arm bar on Ronda. So Ronda's kind of exposing the biz a little, uh, the business a little bit with these tweets. Shows you Ronda's not really happy with Becky. Something happened be between these two, and it might be those shots that Becky gave Ronda at Elimination Chamber. The new story that we heard was that Ronda told Becky to lay into her. I don't know if it meant lay into her head and bust her open like that. Maybe that's what pissed Ronda off. Anyway, Becky Lynch re to, uh, responded, guys, to Ronda Rousey's dick tweet, if you will. <laughs> um, and Becky Lynch kind of went back to her humor, a little bit of comedy. Huh? Actually, it does look exactly like one now that you mention it. And she was talking about the arm looking like a, a dick coming out. You know, she's holding a guy. I don't know. I don't even know how to say this, guys. <laughs> but she actually tweeted out the same photo, but with Ronda Rousey's husband's face at the top of Ron Ronda's arm in the arm bar. So it looks like if it is a dick, the dickhead is Ronda's husband. Can you guys see that? That's Rhonda's husband. So he's basically the dickhead. I hope this makes sense. This is turned middle school style, all right? I feel like I'm back in middle school. If, if, if phones existed when I was in middle school, which luckily they didn't, um, I'm pretty sure this is what would be going around. <laughs> but So there's some type of middle school feud going on, man. Travis's head, who's Rhonda Rousey's husband, she's, he is now a dickhead. And Ronda Rousey is stroking Travis's... Wow. Ronda Rousey had the last word as of the making of this podcast, guys. Thursday evening is when I'm making this. Ronda Rousey last tweeted out in response to Becky. This was at 4 p.m. So this was just uh, about a couple hours ago. Rebecca Quinn, not Becky Lynch. Ronda Rousey said Rebecca Quinn. That's, that's Becky Lynch's real name. Rebecca Quinn, I don't care what the script says. I'm beating the living shit out of you next time I see you. Uh, guys, this goes beyond any kayfabe. This goes beyond a reality work. We've never seen anything like this. There's no way they're telling Ronda Rousey that this is acceptable, man. You're still a PG program. There's adults that love this shit and always will. Um, but you still are trying to bring up a kid fan base as well. That's how every one of us got introduced to pro wrestling. I'm sure a lot of us, most of us, were from the time we were kids. Guys, if they're on social media and they're thinking this is all fun and games, man, and you have... Uh, they're talking about dickheads and, and Travis. Ronda's husband is now the dickhead. And Rebecca Quinn, Becky Lynch, is stroking Travis because he's a... And... Ronda Rousey is saying I'm beating the living shit out of you? This is taking on a life of its own. Fans like us who, who, who see what's going on here, yeah, if you just have Becky versus Ronda at WrestleMania, that's, that's going to be fun. And this, tw this Twitter war or real life beef that they have, if it is, 
I'm not saying 100% it is. I'm just saying this seems to me like a whole nother stratosphere that we're not used to in social media land between pro wrestlers. And we've seen works on Twitter before. This goes above and beyond anything I've ever seen. And it stems back from Monday Night Raw, where Ronda did not look happy with Becky. Ronda was not selling for Becky. Ronda was trying to beat up Becky Lynch, Rebecca Quinn, that night. And now I'm seeing this, guys. This looks pretty real. And if it's not, then the Amplified Man's being worked, and I love it. But there's no way Vince and WWE suits and ties are allowing this. And I wouldn't be surprised if that's ta if that gets taken down. If by the time you're you're watching this, if it already isn't taken down, because this is extreme. I don't even know if Paul Heyman would have this on Extreme Championship Wrestling. <laughs> but the Twitter beef alone, the realism in this, is enough to kind of have a fun little match at WrestleMania. I guess you could say. Because that's way more fun than what's going on in the ring. Storyline wise. Everybody can admit Ronda Rousey and Becky Lynch has gotten stale. There's been a couple of good segments recently between the two. Probably because there is that realism now. That's probably why the Amplified Man has liked the last couple of segments between the two. At Elimination Chamber and this past Monday. But aside from that, it's gotten stale, and we still have six weeks left to WrestleMania. But if you bring that realistic Twitter beef that may be realistic because it is real life, if you bring that to WrestleMania, take my money. I'm down. I still don't know about it being in the last match main event, but if they keep that up, I'm down. What do you guys think, man? You just heard how, how heavy hitting and how... How kind of low blowish these tweets have gotten. To the point of I'm sure many would consider unacceptable. What do you guys think? Is this a work or is this some real life shit? The Amplified Man feels that Ronda Rousey is legit pissed off at Becky Lynch for something. And it all started at Elimination Chamber. Monday Night Raw, man. You go back and watch Ronda. She was not selling at all. And that just didn't look like somebody who's green in the business and just didn't know how to sell correctly. This looked like somebody that was trying to steal a crutcher away and beat the shit out of her. <laughs> That's what she was doing, guys. Amazing. I, I, I would love to tell you I love this Twitter beat, but I, I'm like shocked, guys. I really am. Because you do have a younger audience that is following these two. And Becky Lynch is tweeting out a picture of Rhonda's husband at the top of Rhonda's arm. Becky Lynch is gripping it, and it's a dickhead of Rhonda's husband. And Rhonda's retaliating with Rebecca Quinn. The next time I see you, I'm going to beat the living shit out of you. Not I'm going to beat you up. Not I'm going to take care of business. Not I'm going to keep my title. I'm going to beat the living shit out of you. So uh, there's a... A huge part of me that thinks this is epic. This is awesome. Beyond belief. There's the other side that's shocked. <laughs> and I'm not sure what to think. That's what the comments are down below. Let me know, know, guys, what you guys are thinking. Because that is just absolutely insane, man. That truly is. Um, I got to... During this story, Anger, I don't know if he just took a nosedive because he's like, oh, enough with this Becky Ronda nonsense. Or maybe I was getting so amplified, I accidentally threw Anger off the cliff. But I gotta make sure he's still alive. I'm gonna down the rest of my coffee, guys, before I continue the rest of the podcast. So give me... You guys don't gotta go nowhere. Through the magic of YouTube, like I always tell you guys, all I gotta do is snap my fingers and we're gonna be right back to the rest of the podcast. Uh, but in real time, I need two minutes to down the rest of my coffee, make sure anger is okay, reset up here, and regain my focus. Because there's a lot of good stories to go. Batista bashing The Rock, Tommaso Ciampa already injured, The Undertaker, talking about the creation of The Undertaker character, um, Jericho and what he did with that AEW money, all of this and a lot more, guys, on this week's podcast. We're far from finished. Give me two minutes and we're coming right back. Again, you guys don't got to go nowhere. I'm going to snap my fingers 
And we're going to be back. I said fingers, so that's both. Ready? All right, guys, so anger is good. Apparently, he was just so shocked that Becky Lynch and Ronda Rousey's Twitter beef got that personal and got that volatile that uh, the shock took him over the edge. He's only used to just being angry. The shock was just too much for him. He's good to go, though. He's back. Um, he has overtaken the New York City cab and all is right in the world. Um, let's move on, guys. There's a lot of big stories going on. And again, um, by Sunday, a lot of the, we might know a lot more about this. So it would have been nice to have waited a day or two more before I put this podcast out. But because there's so much to do, this podcast had to go out earlier. But as of right now, guys, uh, Tommaso Ciampa, he does have a neck injury that is not only keeping him, has kept him off of television, he was supposed to be on Monday Night Raw, but it's also kept him off this weekend's live event dates. And there is question on if he'll even be able to compete at TakeOver New York. Now, that's not until April, I believe, April 5th or April, April 6th. Might be that Friday, actually, so that would be April 5th. Um, guys, that's over a month away. If that's the case, then this neck injury is a lot more severe than we first thought. But at first glance, the first reports that we heard was that he was listed as day-to-day. -day. So that doesn't sound too seriously. Day-to-day? -day? We all take that, right? Any day now, he can be back. But then we started hearing the rumblings that he could be off TV for a long time. And that will put his takeover match, that main event match, that'll put that into question. And we're starting to hear that that's already what's being talked about, a replacement. Hopefully it does not come to that. Hopefully this injury isn't that severe. We'll learn more details in the next 48 to 72 hours, obviously. But uh, apparently he was supposed to be competing on Monday Night Raw, guys, in a fatal four-way tag team match. Uh, it was supposed to be Tommaso Ciampa and Gargano as a tag team, taking on Aleister Black and Ricochet as a tag team, taking on Ryder and Hawkins as a tag team, taking on the house party, the Lucha house party. Wow, that would have been riveting. I don't know who would have needed to see that fatal four-way tag team match. I'm sure that was to set up maybe number one contenders for the tag title. I, I don't understand how that would have worked. And then a couple of your call-ups would be losing in that match then. Because if you have Aleister Black and Ricochet in there with Tommaso Ciampa and Gargano, only one team can win the fatal four-way tag team match. Right? Ryder and Hawkins weren't going to win. The Lucha House Party wasn't going to win. It's going to be one of those NXT teams. Which means one of them is losing. Which one do you have lose? As it turns out, Ciampa couldn't even compete. Gargano was just using a backstage segment with Shawn Michaels for the Ric Flair 70th birthday celebration. And Ricochet and Aleister Black were used in a tag team match, defeating the Revival. So, oh, how plans change, man. Um, what else? But yeah, that's the news, guys. He, he, Tommaso Ciampa was supposed to be on the Raw slash SmackDown weekend shows, and he was taking off. So those, uh, those fans going out to those shows this weekend, you will not be seeing Tommaso Ciampa, unless there was a last minute change that we're not aware of. And just like that, he got medically cleared because the word right now is he is not medically cleared to compete. So that would have had to been a really last-minute decision. Again, guys, it's kind of later now on a Thursday evening, and the word is he is not cleared. This is your NXT champion, guys. That's why this is a big news story. Not just your NXT champion, not just the guy who's going to be in the NXT main event at TakeOver New York, but a guy who is now wrestling on Raw and SmackDown as well. And already, he is injured. It looked like he had a leg injury two Monday Night Raws ago, and it ends up being a neck injury. It could be both. But either way, he is taken out of action already. Reminds me of Mustafa Ali, man. Ali finally gets a break on the main roster, and he's already concussed to the point where he's on a multi-week hiatus. They will not clear Mustafa Ali. 
Tommaso Ciampa missed a few shows. He thought he'd be back. Uh-uh. Now he is not being cleared for the foreseeable future. Again, that's what we're being told. It's a big story we got to keep our eyes on. Dean Ambrose. I told you guys from the beginning when WWE released a message on their social media saying that Dean Ambrose will not be re-signing with the company after WrestleMania. In other words, WrestleMania is his contract ending. You will not be seeing Dean Ambrose anymore. I told you guys it seemed like a work to me. A, first and foremost, Vince McMahon is too smart. He's not going to just let a talent like Dean Ambrose go. B, Vince McMahon has a total orgasm whenever you mention the Shield. That is his go-to. Whenever he wants Roman to go over anything, he'll put together the Shield. Right? That's his autopilot backup plan. That is his, his audible it's always in his pocket to use the Shield reunion. Vince McMahon isn't just going to let one third of the Shield just walk away. Thirdly, and most importantly, they're not going to announce it months in advance. So Dean Ambrose is the talk of the town for months, especially when AEW is formating. AEW is starting to come into its own. It's WrestleMania season, and you're putting the focus, the spotlight, on a guy who's not going to resign with your company. Or at least that's what you're claiming. WWE never sends those messages out. If they can't come to terms with somebody renewing their contract, then when they part ways with the company, WWE will issue a statement about the release of a superstar, and we wish them well in all their future endeavors. But months in advance, when you know you have months to work with the superstar in trying to get a contract extension signed, or a new contract as, whole, as a whole signed, I mean, we don't know, Vince doesn't know, Dean doesn't know if in, a, in two weeks, a month, two months from that statement, they were going to change their mind. Every year at your job, guys, if you don't know where you're going to be the following year, is your company going to go and broadcast it on your company website? Or are they going to release a flyer saying that Joe Schmo will not be back with ShopRite next year? Right? Billy Buttfuck McGee will not be returning to Home Depot next year? Or next season, Danny Dipshit Dugenheimer will not be coming back to Lowe's? Or Hobby Lobby will no longer have the services of Sally Sizzletits? What job do you know of months in advance says that somebody won't be with us four months from now? It doesn't happen, guys. I've never seen it. People brought up like Kevin Nash. That was a totally different situation and not three plus months in advance. I assure you, I was around for that. So I told you guys from the beginning, this all seems like a work. But now, new evidence has surfaced that Dean Ambrose is going nowhere after WrestleMania. That new evidence is he is now put on live events post-WrestleMania, guys. And I'm not just talking a week or two weeks after Mania in April. I'm talking May events. May. A month after Mania. Dean Ambrose is on the sheets. He is being advertised for those towns. So this is showing that Dean Ambrose will be with the company. So either this was a work from the beginning, or just like I had thought from the beginning, he re-signed. They came to a decision with each other. I doubt very much this was just a mistake by WWE Promotional. They have made pretty big mistakes in the past, trust me. I just don't feel this is one of them. Now this could become a big story and they could take that off now because it's affecting the proposed work that was supposed to be happening. So you might see that promotional work get taken off. But I don't think that was a mistake. I think he will be at those live events in April and in May and going forward after WrestleMania. And more evidence. Recently, Roman Reigns was at an autograph session. He was asked about Dean Ambrose. And this is a quote from Roman Reigns. He was asked at this autograph session about Ambrose leaving after WrestleMania. And Roman Reigns said, don't worry, we're working on that, end quote.
We're working on that, guys. First of all, who's we? Does Roman Reigns have that much pull that he's also a suit and tie back there? He snaps his fingers and people get signed? Probably. Wouldn't doubt it. But Roman Reigns said, we're working on it. So it doesn't look like Roman Reigns is going to let him go anywhere. Or at least he knows that Vince is not going to let Dean go anywhere. It's not happening. So, we don't know, guys. Whether this is a work or, n or not, I do not think Dean Ambrose is going anywhere. Personal belief. You have your own, it's in the eye of the beholder. Let me know what you guys think, man, about this new evidence that surfaced. He is now put on live events in May, well after WrestleMania. Roman Reigns said, don't worry, we're working on it. Do you guys think Dean's actually leaving? Remains to be seen, man. This is a good one, man. This is Batista, and he doubled down after this, too. Batista... It was the, uh, the Tampa Bay Times. They conducted a, an interview with Batista. And they asked Batista if they thought The Rock was a, a great actor. And this is a quote from Batista. Batista said, fuck no. <laughs> is that not Batista? That's what we love about Batista. He doesn't beat around the bush. He does, he's not fake. He's not going to lie to you. He was asked if The Rock is a great actor. In his opinion, he said, fuck no. He went on and he says this, and this is, I quote. He says, I want good roles. I don't care about the Fast and the Furious or Bumblebee. I want to work with Academy Award winners. There is something special about The Rock. I never take that away from him. But would I consider him a great actor? Fuck no. Now, this kind of took off a story of its own on social media, and people were blasting uh, Batista for blasting The Rock. In fact, there was, a, there was a title, I guess you could say, a headline, or maybe headlines, many of them, calling Batista out, and the headline read, Batista blast The Rock on acting ability. So this forced Batista to go back on social media and correct everyone and say, I wasn't trying to bash anybody. But he said, I stand by my interview and I stand by my words. So he's saying it's no beef with The Rock. I'm not trying to bash The Rock. I'm saying I don't consider him a great actor. He's got something special in him. He always has. And he's damn good. But I'm not going to put him in some great category. I'm not going to pay homage to something that I don't feel deserves it. It's basically what he's saying. He doubled down. And he said, I don't care what you guys are claiming I said. I didn't bash anybody on purpose. I stand by my words. That's huge. Batista could have took the approach that everybody else takes when they offend somebody or when they create a shitstorm. They face backlash, so they go on their social media and they apologize. And they say, that's not what I was trying to do. It's not what I meant. What I meant was, and then they go back. And in this situation, he'd probably say something like, I think The Rock is one of the greatest actors ever. My words were just misconstrued. No. Batista said, I stand by every word I said. I wasn't intentionally bashing anybody for the, for the record. So... Think about it how you will. I don't give a shit. I stand by my words. I love that, guys. This could create some animosity between Batista and The Rock, but I don't think Batista gives two shits. And The Rock has so much money and so much going for him, so many roles, till the year 2040, that I'm sure he's not going to give a shit about it. But The Rock has shown in the past, by what John Cena has said about him, that he will hold a grudge. So even though it won't upset him, he's not going to lose sleep over it. He's not going to lose meals over this. He might hold a grudge in the future. And that's just fun. Because then maybe we'll see The Rock and Batista in the future in some type of way. I'd love to see that, man. I'll take another match between The Rock and Batista with a little bit of fuel added to the fire like we saw with Cena in The Rock. There was a real beef there for a while because John Cena called The Rock out in real life. About getting huge to the point where he forgot about where he came from. And now John Cena 
and said, wow, if only I could have went back several years when I said those comments because now I'm in The Rock's position, not totally in that limelight, not totally in The Rock's shadow. I'm a far away from it. The Rock is his own entity. But now that I'm living that lifestyle, I see that it's super hard to juggle the two. And it's not forgetting where you come from. You just have to take on kind of a different role. You have to take on a different identity. So he has since apologized to The Rock. And The Rock, the, the, the Rock, the Rock laughs about it to this day. And uh, I just don't know if this is the same situation though. Because Batista is living that lifestyle now that The Rock is. Again, not to that level, but he's living that lifestyle. And he's saying he's not a great actor. So I don't know if Batista can ever go back and say, I wish I had a little bit more common sense when I made those statements. No, there's no more common sense you could have. Well, words he spoke is the same words he's going to carry with him 10, 20 years from now. If he doesn't think The Rock is a great actor now, he's not going to think he is 10 years from now. Who knows, guys? I just thought that was awesome. But Batista doesn't give two shits when he gives interviews. That's why I love... If I miss the interview and I can't watch it, I love reading the transcripts of his interviews. Because he doesn't give a shit. He's gonna tell you the truth like he did with the Triple H saga. And he told every interviewer that he came across that he's been trying to work with the WWE again. He's been trying to contact Triple H and Vince. They will not answer his phone calls. And he was getting pissed! He felt like they were just shunning him, you know, on purpose. And he was getting pissed and he was telling interviewers this. I love that about Batista. All right, moving on, guys. That, and again, that started from the Tampa Bay Times, uh, an article in the Tampa Bay Times. So let's stick with Tampa Bay here. Chris Jericho in Tampa Bay. What do they have in common? Well, Chris Jericho took that huge AEW money that he just got. He's already... Cashing some checks, it looks like, because he just bought a brand new, maybe not brand new, I think it was lived in before, or maybe it is brand new, actually. Either way, a damn expensive $3.3 million home in Tampa Bay. So the Jerichos are moving in to Tampa Bay. I think they already had a home there, but now they're in a, a new suburb in a $3.3 million home. You know AEW is giving him a lot of money, guys. To make that life-altering decision, that has to be something that you've been thinking about for a while. You're thinking about it. You're putting, you're crunching your, your finances together. Yeah, we can afford it, but should we pull the trigger now? Oh, I don't know. AEW comes along. They give you millions of dollars, and you're like, Honey, let's get the house now. So a $3.3 million house in Tampa Bay. Again, he already had a home in Tampa Bay. This is a different suburb. Um, good for him, man. That is awesome. You guys know I love Florida. Tampa Bay is a great area, right next to one of my favorite places in the world, Orlando. So uh, you get the best of both worlds, man. I said the Jerichos were moving, right? The Irvines. I think that's his real name, right? Chris Irvine. The Irvines have moved... Up in the world. As if they already didn't have a multi-million dollar home. It must be nice to just buy multiple million dollar homes. Good for Jericho. If there's anybody that deserves it in this business, it's Jericho, guys. Running a band in Fozzie. Doing what he does, does in professional wrestling. His podcast. Every interview that he does not turn down. The guy always makes himself accessible. He's a one of a kind in the business. And he keeps re- What's the word I want, man? He keeps redefining himself for sure. But what's the word I want, man? He keeps himself fresh is the best way to put it. He never gets stale. And when he thinks that a part of him or a character is getting stale, he reinvents himself. I guess that's the best word I'll use. He, he is the king at reinventing his character. He never gets stale, and on top of that, every character he comes out with, he makes it a legit bona fide superstar. It's amazing, man. It, it truly is. And Jericho said in a recent interview that he feels that he des is deserving of Brock Lesnar-type money. And guys, whether you put Jericho in that level or not, I agree with him. 
I think if you want Jericho to be a part of your promotion, you give him Lesnar money. You don't even call it Lesnar money, you call it Jericho money. Every dime that AEW gave Jericho, I think, is a dime well spent. Well worth it. Beyond measures. No question. Speaking of AEW, can I talk Kenny Omega real quick? There was an article where he actually was asked who his dream WWE opponent would be. If he could have that one WWE match at a WrestleMania, who would it be? Who do you guys think it was? I'm hearing a lot of good names. Spoiler. AJ Styles is who Kenny Omega picked. Now, they had their beef in New Japan Pro Wrestling, absolutely. But there ain't any one of us that can say, and if we did say it, we'd be lying to one another or lying to yourselves if you said you wouldn't like to see Omega and AJ Styles in a WWE ring. We all would love to see that. But a dream match? Would that be the dream match for Omega for you guys? Answer down below, man. If you had one match you would like to see Omega perform in WWE, would it be AJ Styles? Would it be Daniel Bryan, a Kofi Kingston, Mustafa Ali, a Ricochet, Randy Orton, John Cena, Battle of Stars? Those are all good options. I'll let you guys know who I would pick. Again, doesn't matter. Omega already picked. He said AJ Styles. That would be phenomenal. I would pick Seth Rollins. Guys, I just feel like Styles and Omega in a WWE ring would turn out the same way Shinsuke and Styles did. We all thought it was going to be a dream match from what we saw in New Japan Pro Wrestling, and it didn't quite click in a WWE ring. Multiple times, it didn't click. They kept kind of getting better than the match previous, but it never quite clicked. I just feel that Styles and Omega in a WWE ring would follow the same path, follow suit of Styles and Nakamura. I feel, here's my pick for Omega's dream match, Seth Rollins. I feel that Omega and Rollins, the chemistry inside of a WWE ring would be second to none. I feel they would play off each other exceptionally. I feel they would know exactly when to turn the pace up, when to slow it down and make it a much more psychological thriller, when to go move for move in a fast paced setting, when to go to the aerial, aerial assault, and when to go maneuver for maneuver on the ground game. Everything I feel would go off as close to, if not flawless, as possible. That is just how I feel with a Rollins Omega match. Goosebumps thinking about it, man. But he picked Styles, and we would all love to see that. But, you know, for the foreseeable future, guys, the next three to five years up front, he signed that deal with AEW. Um, there is a three-year outage clause, but it's really for five years with AEW. That's going to make him a lot older, a lot more mileage on his body wrestling-wise. So if he ever does go over to WWE, you know, where... Man... Is him and Seth Rollins really going to be in their prime still? Five years from now? I don't think so, you know? I think this would have only went off if it was in within the next five years. It doesn't look like that's going to happen. But I guess that's why they call them dream matches, right? It's what we yearn for. We don't actually think we're going to get them. But you never know. Once in a while, we get a dream match we never thought we'd see. But that would be mine, guys. Rollins and Omega. Um... Where do you guys want to go? Can I just say that The Undertaker has been... This guy's been weird lately, man. Not only is he taking bookings... And, and I say weird in a good way for all of us. Because now we get The Undertaker in a much more accessible way. But it's something we never thought we'd see. The guy started up a Twitter? You're telling me you thought you'd see The Undertaker on social media? Bullshit. But he is. He's on social media. Uh, he took off references of WWE. He started taking external bookings... From StarCast. I'm sure if AEW offered him $25,000 an hour, he's going to take that. The guy has went into business for his own, and I like it, man. You know, you're not owned by Vince McMahon. He doesn't own you. You're your own person. You got your own business. You're your own identity. I love that. But make no mistake, you got to know that Vince McMahon is letting him use the Undertaker name for these endeavors. You have to believe that. 
So I don't think they're totally on the outs, but The Undertaker is making money on his own. That's got to be kind of frustrating McMahon to a degree. It's not like letting The Rock keep the name. The Rock is bringing in eyeballs of WWE, but when you have The Undertaker showing up the StarCast, what is that doing for WWE? Nothing. But more so, guys, he's doing all these uh, interviews now. I've seen a couple recently of The Undertaker um, out of the kayfabe world, out of character. And I saw another one with this uh, Christian host. I'm sorry I don't have his name, but he does a lot of interviews. He did one with Shawn Michaels, Sting, and now The Undertaker. He does a lot of interviews with um, wrestlers that have extreme faith in their life. And we know Shawn Michaels is huge uh, in his faith. Sting is huge, Steve Borden, in his faith, and The Undertaker. So we had an interview with The Undertaker, and The Undertaker was out of character, and he covered a lot of topics. And I love hearing the story of when The Undertaker was created. He already had quit WCW in 89. He goes over to uh, uh, Stanford, Connecticut, meets with Vince McMahon. He thought that Vince was going to hire him that day. And Vince, at the end of the interview, said, All right, so we don't have anything for you now, but if something comes up, we'll call you. Those are dreaded words when you're going to look for a job. Undertaker was blown away because he said, oh, I didn't think this is how it was going to work. I already quit WCW. I don't have a job. And Vince is like, I don't have anything right now, but I'll call you if I get something. And Undertaker had to go home. Mark Calloway sitting by the phone. A couple weeks later, the phone actually rang. It was Vince McMahon on the other end. And he just said, is this the Undertaker? And Mark Calloway's like, uh, yeah, it's the Undertaker. Shocked. Because he had thought if he got the phone call... They were going to make him an egg called the gobbledygooker. This was a an egg that was going to hatch at Survivor Series 89, guys. This is no joke. You can go back and look for yourself. It was in Hartford, Connecticut. Um, I was there live. I'll never forget this. I was just a kid. I was there live in Hartford, Connecticut. An egg was about to hatch. And Undertaker thought he was going to be called the Eggman. And when he got the phone call saying he was going to be the Undertaker, he was blown away. And uh, the rest is history. So I love hearing these Undertaker stories out of character. I uh, love that shit. Um, do you want to go to Sean Waltman? I I guess I'll bring it up. Right, it's, a, it's my podcast. I love talking about everything. That's why I'm giving you these Undertaker stories that I love. Sean Waltman was asked who should induct DX into the Hall of Fame. Now, I guess the list is very limited. We would think DX have, has had a long historic career in their short runs, multiple runs. But who's their real feuds, guys? I mean, when you think about it, they went through so many face heel turns and different variations. Right? Do you say Stone Cold was their big feud? Do you say Vince McMahon was? Do you have Stone Cold induct them? Do you have Vince McMahon? It doesn't really fit with DX. None of them. So do you have an arch nemesis? Does Bret Hart induct him? I don't think he'd ever induct Shawn Michaels into anything. Uh, but the piece of shit Hall of Fame, right? Because even though they shook hands several times, Bret Hart doesn't like Shawn Michaels at all. And I know the feeling is mutual. Who do you go to? So X-Pac, Shawn Waltman, he had a, a, I guess you could say a name. I don't know if it's a valid name. He said Mike Tyson. Now, yeah, he has history with DX, but it's very brief history, A. And B, do you honestly trust a guy like Mike Tyson to deliver a six-page monologue before they induct DX or bring DX onto the stage? Do you trust Mike Tyson with that job? Because I know I don't, and I love Mike Tyson. It'd be funny as hell, but I don't know if I trust Mike Tyson. Oh my, he'll be up there all night long. He'll be up there like, uh, who was it, Mr. T? Talking about his mama? And if it wasn't for my mama, this wouldn't happen. And my mama did this for me. And you all gotta respect my mama. And did I mention that this is all for my mama? And it went on for 42 minutes about Mr. T's mama. I don't even want to think about what, Mi what Mike Tyson would talk about for 42 minutes. But I thought that was interesting. What do you guys think? Are you okay with Mike Tyson? In introducing them onto the stage because you know usually it's a multi-minute presentation uh, man can Vince McMahon afford to give Mike Tyson that platform again it would be entertainment no doubt 
But wow, that's taking a risk. That's taking a big time risk. Also, in that same uh, interview, guys, Sean Waltman said, uh, because there's a lot of discussion online about Rick Rude. He was a part of DX, the original formation. But a lot of people didn't think he didn't click and you really stabbed the company in the back. Remember that night where he showed up on Raw because it was taped? And that same night he showed up on Nitro because it was live? Vince was pissed. And that's no doubt why you're not hearing Rick Rude going into the Hall of Fame with the rest of DX. But Sean Waltman, X-Pac, he said... He said he doesn't think Rick Rude deserves to be going in with them, period. Because he did stab them in the back, A. And B... He wasn't a big part of DX. He was there for a small time frame. He never really clicked with them. Do you guys agree with Sean Waltman? Because there was a lot of people that were with DX for a short amount of time. There was a lot of different variations. Rick Rude was the original variation. Aside from the original three, right? China, Shawn Michaels, Triple H. But Rick Rude was a big part. I felt, I remember all those Rick Rude segments in DX. Now, if he didn't click with them, that's more of a behind-the-scenes matter. And as far as stabbing the company in the back, there's multiple people that stab the company in the back, and they're in the Hall of Fame right now. I'm not saying he's deserving totally. I'm just opening, opening the platform down below the comments as to what you guys feel about the situation. I'm kind of 50-50 on it. I'm totally game if they decided to put him in, and they decided not to. And I'm kind of okay with that too. I don't know really... I'm not on one side of the pendulum more than the other. You know what I mean? If I had to pick, I'm inducting Rick Rude with them. If I had to. If I was forced, BC, you gotta pick one or the other. I would say put Rick Rude in. Why not? First of all, the guy has had a storied history in the WWE no matter what. And he was, I felt, a part, a big part... At first, of DX. I guess that's in the eye of the beholder, though, guys. You know what I mean? Everyone has a different take on it. But uh, Sean Waltman is dead set on the way he feels. Rick Rude should not be going in with the rest of DX. All right. He does say he's going to mention Tori, though. Tori was a big part of DX's success. She's not going in either with them. Uh, but he's going to um, name bomb her, name drop her. So I guess that's good. Alright, hold up guys. We had to do a little cut there because I got word, information, that WWE has already edited their websites. Their promotion is no longer showing both Dean Ambrose and Roman Reigns now for their post-WrestleMania Europe tour. I don't know if I mentioned that earlier guys, but I talked about Ambrose being on live events in May. And one of those big e events, it was a tour, the post-WrestleMania Europe tour that they go on. And Dean Ambrose was advertised for it. Guys, that has now been removed. So literally, I just spoke about this, what, 15, 20 minutes ago, tops. And they, obviously, this has made its way around the, the social media circulization it got back to WWE. Oh, how could you let this leak? You know damn well Roman is cleared right now for competition. You know damn well he's going to be a part of Mania. You know damn well he's going to Europe. So why are you taking Roman Reigns off? You want to wait for the big surprise, the big reveal. You know damn well Dean Ambrose is going to be there. But you just are playing off the storyline that he's leaving at WrestleMania. So you took him off too. You're not pulling one over on the Amplified, man. So... WWE is trying to cover their tracks. They have removed Dean Ambrose from the post-WrestleMania Europe tour. Um, but I think it's too late, man. I, I don't see how you can make that mistake. If the guy is no longer under contract after Mania, you're not promoting him. Just like Roman Reigns, you didn't make a mistake in putting one of your top stars, Roman Reigns, on a post-WrestleMania tour of Europe, and then all of a sudden you went, oops, he shouldn't have been on there. When you know damn well Roman Reigns is going to be on that tour. Damn well. So I just had to break that to you guys, man. The story is ever-changing in the WWE world, man. When something leaks out or something is taken on a life of its own and they don't want you to 
think a certain way, they don't want you following that narrative, they're going to try to change it. I see through the bullshit. That's why I'm the one in front of this camera. That's why I'm the one doing these podcasts. So you guys have all the facts, man. Or at least all the information to judge your own facts. What is fact from fiction? To come to your own conclusion. You know, I'm over here just giving you guys the information, guys. So just as fast as I announced Dean Ambrose is being marketed and promoted after Mania, they're trying to take him now off of it. You still got Roman Reigns out there going, we're working on it. We're going to make sure Dean Ambrose goes nowhere. Don't worry, Roman. Vince McMahon is making sure Ambrose goes nowhere. So how about that, guys? All in one podcast. News is constantly rotating. I could just imagine by Sunday what we're going to be hearing. Um, before I end the podcast, guys, I know we're, we're about to go over an hour. Um, leading into WrestleMania season, I want to keep these at around an hour. I know we got a lot uh, to do toward the end of winter heading into spring. So I'm not going to take a lot of your guys' time. I feel around an hour uh, is pretty decent. Once Mania gets real closer, then we're probably going to be dishing out two two plus hour podcasts again. Um, but I'll try to keep this one around an hour so you guys can go and kick the rest of the day's ass, the rest of the weekend's ass. Um, a couple more things I do want to talk about though. Colt Cabana, uh, Colt Cabana, Cabana, I like that, Colt Cabana. <laughs> Colt Cabana, his lawsuit is ongoing with uh, CM Punk. Colt Cabana is pissed off because CM Punk is no longer financing Um the lawsuit that he had with WWE. He thought him and CM Punk, Phil Brooks, were both in it against WWE. He thought they were in it together. And now that it's over, CM Punk isn't paying Colt Cabana's bills anymore. Those legal bills. So Cabana took him to court saying, hey man, he promised he was going to pay for mine too. Basically, there's a lot more to it. And uh, CM Punk now, his legal team, is now filing for a motion to dismiss the case. They're trying to get this done with before they actually leak into a trial. They're trying to dis dismiss this thing and basically say, listen, he's got no legs to stand on. Not literally, guys. <laughs> Not only is he a broadcaster over there in ROH, he still wrestles from time to time. But as a legal battle, him and his legal team have no legs to stand on. That's what CM Punk and his legal team is trying to say. Like when it comes to a legal ground... It's clear we're not in violation of anything. It's clear we're just wasting our time and our money if we go forward. It remains to be seen what the final judgment is going to be. But it's clear that CM Punk wants this over and done with. This is the final piece of the puzzle for CM Punk. The first big piece, the first half of the puzzle, is when he defeated WWE and their doctor, Mr. Amon. After that... He now needs to just get rid of this Colt Cabana situation, including Colt Cabana, in what he deems as a bogus lawsuit. And once that is out of CM Punk's hair, he no longer, according to his own words, has to deal with professional wrestling ever again. Until the cons over there in AEW walk their asses over to CM Punk's house, knock on that door, and present him with a $5 million check. That's right, I think CM Punk would be the first person ever to receive $5 million for a two to three year contract, limited dates. It's like a Brock Lesnar schedule, but on crack. A Brock Lesnar schedule, but on steroids. You know damn well he'd at least get three to five million up front, guys, in a limited schedule. And creative control. And anything else under the sun that he would want. I just think that if Punk is ever going to do business with pro wrestling again, before it's even WWE is ever going to be a consideration, he's going to be with AEW. It's a perfect fit, and it's a big fuck you to Vince. But I think it's going to be a while. I really do feel that what he's saying, he's, he's going to be true to himself, even though I feel like he's a douchebag most of the time. I do feel that once this Colt Cabana trial is out of his hair, out of his head, out of his life, I really do think then... In his mindset, he can really walk away from pro wrestling finally. Until money comes calling, until there's a big event and he can tell, sell some t-shirts and some autographs and some photos, and he'll say, fuck you to pro wrestling, 
unless he can make some money off of it, then wrestling is cool and I like wrestling fans again. That's why I think he's a contradicting uh, dipshit. But once this Colt Cabana thing is done, uh, don't be surprised if, if CM Punk really at that point feels that he's done with pro wrestling. He said it numerous times. He can't quite get away from it until this is done. He thought the WWE thing was going to be it. And then his own buddy Colt Cabana uh, sues him. But it looks to me like he agreed to do something and then turned his back on his buddy. Then don't agree to fund something, if that's the case. A lot of CM Punk's friends have went on record and say he stabbed them in the back. Or he's not loyal. He's not faithful. I noticed it from day one. There was something about this cat always contradicting himself, always coming off as a, as a douchebag. I can respect an asshole, but a douchebag? Something about CM Punk, man, doesn't sit right with me. And, uh, and that's why a lot of his own personal friendships end tragically. Or just end, period. I don't know. So we'll see where this Coca Cabana scene. I don't know where I'm going with this. I'm just fucking spewing shit now. You know what I mean? My fucking podcast. And when we talk CM Punk, I'm going to be real with you, man. It might be hard hitting. It might sound like I'm bashing the guy. But like Batista says about The Rock, I'm not going to change my words. I'm going to double down. I think the dude's a douchebag. The dude's a douchebag. Um, Kofi Kingston, I'll end it with this. Kofi Kingston finally broke his silence. He went on Twitter and he says, I need a few days to process this. Um, I'm experiencing shock, sadness, anger. I just can't believe it was all ripped away from me. If you've experienced the roller coaster ride of my career over the last 11 years, you know how hard I, I fought for this and you know what this meant for me and to me. And to have it ripped away from me last second, I just need time to process it. But thank you all, and I promise you, this journey is far from over. So that was Kofi Kingston's paraphrased tweet. Uh, he finally broke his silence, and uh, Kofi Kingston is vowing that this is not over. And this looks like it's leading to Kofi Mania. That is episode 9 of the Amplified Podcast, guys. I hope you enjoy the rest of your weekend. I will see you guys this Tuesday morning for the Amplified Monday Night Raw review and reaction. I felt they delivered last Monday, but they have to change their redundant, lackluster, mediocre matches that they keep putting on. They gave us some good segments, some good moments. What about the matches? It's the same as 2018. They're nonsensical bullshit matches. They have to change a lot. I'm not giving them any mulligans. We'll talk about that, SmackDown, and a whole lot more next week. For now, holla at your boy. Holla at Mitch Jr., because your boys are out. Peace. For now, check you later.